It's a long awaited experience, you know, to finally show my innocence and I have this beautiful family to support me that never never doubted me, always supported me, always believed in me, and encouraged me to always think positive and move forward. What did the other inmates say when you left, Juan? They were all elated. I was at work, believe it or not, before they came and told me that I was being released, and they all started crying, hugged me. Did you have doubts this day would come? Yeah, <laughs> I had doubts, you know, but I was always, as I told you before, optimistic that it will come soon. I just didn't know when, and today I was caught by surprise. Being in prison, surrounded by individuals that are serial killers, rapists, mass murderers, I mean, arsonists, extortionists, I mean, not knowing what prison is like to going into an environment that is unnatural to you, it's very difficult. So, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it's, it's hell. I mean, there's no other way to explain how it is to be in prison, it's hell. Uh, I was stabbed twice because of this case. A uh, prison that I, does not allow any individual to serve time for raping or murdering any child, whether it be male or female. So yes, while I was in prison, I got beat up a few times. I got stabbed twice, went hungry a couple of times. So yes, I went through a lot while I was in prison. On August 17th, 1992, the city of Waukegan, Illinois, witnessed a most horrific and unforgivable crime. This is the tragic story of Holly Staker, a young, bright and spirited 11-year-old girl who was babysitting two children, Blake, five, and Taylor, two, at 442 Hickory Street, the home of their mother, Dawn Engelbrecht. Holly reached Dawn's house at 4 p.m., conveniently located just three blocks from her home. Holly's natural affinity for children was always on full display, and the kids adored her. She treated the kids to some pizza, and after their meal, young Blake joined his friends outside to play. Around 8 p.m., one of Dawn's neighbors noticed Blake was still outside, which deeply concerned her. The neighbor approached Blake and inquired as to why he was still outdoors. Blake shared that Holly, his babysitter, was not answering the door. After receiving no answer herself, the neighbor took Blake to his mother's job at John's Cheers, a neighborhood tavern. When Dawn saw her neighbor with Blake in tow, she immediately knew something was wrong. The neighbor recounted the events, prompting Dawn to urgently call Holly. Receiving no response, she promptly contacted Holly's mother, Nancy Kalinowski. In a swift decision, the pair decided to convene at Dawn's residence to ensure the safety of both Holly and Taylor, pondering whether the situation might be a misunderstanding. However, upon their arrival at 8.30 p.m., the room was dimly lit by a flickering television, obscuring the presence of crimson stains scattered throughout the apartment. There were conflicting reports regarding the whereabouts of young Taylor. One account claimed she was playing in the middle of the living room floor, while another placed her on a bed within the apartment. Nonetheless, both versions agreed she was found safe and unharmed. Somewhat relieved, the couple faced a daunting challenge in locating Holly. Holly's mother promptly dialed 911, but while awaiting police, the couple made the fateful decision to conduct another search for Holly. What they would uncover would irrevocably alter the course of their lives. Tragically, Holly was discovered on the bedroom floor, concealed behind a closed door. She was partially clothed and unresponsive. Dreadfully, Holly had endured a savage assault, receiving 27 harrowing wounds from a sharp object. Dawn, a witness to this grim sight, recounted, I peered behind the door, and there lay Holly. I reached out and touched her. She was cold. Blake, who had followed his mother, also bore witness and announced the devastating news to Holly's mother, who stood in the kitchen. When police arrived at the scene, a broken back door was discovered to be the entry point of the perpetrator, who utilized a mop handle as a battering ram. Holly's case launched one of the largest investigations in the county's history. After a grueling 10-week investigation, the perpetrator confessed. 
The only problem was he didn't commit the crime, and DNA would later prove his innocence. But why would anyone confess to a crime they didn't commit? Meet Juan Rivera, a 19-year-old originally from Puerto Rico, with a history of psychological impairments. Rivera's cognitive limitations significantly impacted his ability to comprehend complex legal matters and left him susceptible to the unyielding pressure exerted by case investigators. With a below-average IQ, Rivera found himself particularly vulnerable during interrogations. His struggles in grasping intricate questions rendered him liable to furnish inconsistent, coerced, and blatantly false statements. In the relentless pursuit of a credible suspect after Holly's passing, law enforcement grappled with the investigation for over two months. Finally, Rivera came under scrutiny when a jailhouse informant by the name of Armando Serrano alleged that Rivera had confessed to the murder while awaiting trial for an unrelated, non-violent burglary. Remarkably, no tangible evidence could link Rivera to the brutal assault. Furthermore, data from an ankle monitor, which Rivera wore while awaiting trial for the burglary, unequivocally indicated that he was nowhere near the crime scene. However, ignoring those facts, in late October of 1992, Rivera found himself in Lake County Jail, subjected to intermittent interrogations for four days. During this time, he was transported twice to a Reed Technique headquarters in Chicago, for polygraph tests administered by Reed specialist Michael Masokas. While the polygraph results were inconclusive, Masokas purportedly indicated that the evidence leaned towards Rivera's guilt. Eventually, after enduring additional rounds of questioning, Rivera reluctantly signed a confession even though it didn't match the crime scene at all. Detectives thought it was good enough. The prosecutor encountered significant challenges when Rivera's confession didn't align with the details of the crime. In response, investigators conducted multiple rounds of interrogation with Rivera, subtly introducing information about the crime to influence his confession. Consequently, Rivera's confession underwent significant alterations during these interrogations, suggesting potential coercion or manipulation by the investigators. Notably, his confession lacked critical details that only the actual perpetrator would possess, casting doubt on its reliability. The details of Rivera's confession never matched the scene. In his initial confession, Rivera gave an incorrect description of the victim's clothing and the murder weapon, which raised questions about his knowledge of the crime. In addition, he couldn't accurately detail the location of the crime scene. Subsequently, in his second version, Rivera altered his story significantly providing a different timeline and changing key details of what occurred. Finally, in his third version, Rivera again altered the sequence of events and couldn't provide consistent answers about crucial elements of the crime. Rivera's confessions became the focal point of rigorous examination and stirred significant controversy during subsequent legal proceedings. Despite substantial doubts about his guilt, Rivera endured three trials, three convictions, and a life sentence from each jury. In 1993, during Rivera's first trial, he stood before a courtroom accused of a horrible crime. Rivera's confession, the linchpin of the prosecution's case, had been extracted during a lengthy police interrogation. However, it was far from a straightforward admission of guilt. His confession was marked by inconsistencies and doubts, largely due to Rivera's intellectual limitations. What added intrigue to the case was the stark absence of any physical or forensic evidence linking Rivera to the crime scene. The entirety of the case hinged heavily on his confession. In his defense, Rivera's legal team put forth a compelling argument. They contended that the confession had been coerced and that Rivera, with his intellectual challenges, was not mentally capable of fully comprehending the implications of his statements. Despite these compelling concerns and the cloud of doubt, perhaps reasonable doubt that loomed over the confession, the verdict was delivered. Rivera was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. However, this was not the end, but only the beginning. And on appeal, Rivera's conviction was overturned in 1995 due to the lack of physical evidence and issues surrounding his confession. However, the prosecution did not relent, and Rivera was tried again for the crime. 
In his second trial in 1998, the prosecution relied heavily on the disputed confession as their key piece of evidence. During the trial, questions about the reliability of Rivera's confession persisted. His defense team presented evidence suggesting that the confession had been coerced and that Rivera's limited intellectual capabilities made him vulnerable to manipulation. The absence of concrete physical evidence connecting him to the crime persisted, and the case continued to pivot on the credibility of his confession. Despite the lingering doubts surrounding the confession, Rivera faced another conviction and received a life sentence. Upon his second appeal, Rivera's conviction was overturned again. This time, the appellate court found that Rivera's confession had been coerced during a lengthy and intense interrogation. They concluded that his confession was not voluntary and thus not reliable. In addition, the appellant court found that there was no physical evidence linking him to the crime. The absence of forensic evidence was a significant factor in their decision to overturn his conviction. Lastly, the court reviewed new DNA evidence that did not match Juan Rivera, which contradicted his confession and further raised doubts about his guilt. Yet with contradicting DNA evidence in hand, the prosecution opted for a third trial in 2009, but this time DNA evidence conclusively ruled him out as the perpetrator. With this revelation, the defense passionately argued that Rivera should have been exonerated given the stark absence of any physical link between him and the crime. The trial sparked widespread public outcry and ignited heated debates as it appeared unfathomable that Rivera could be found guilty once again when DNA evidence unequivocally pointed away from his culpability. Unfortunately, the third time was not the charm and Rivera was found guilty again by a jury of his peers. Because prosecutors suggested that Holly was intimately active with men and that the DNA collected may have come from a consensual act, alluding to the possibility that the perpetrator did not leave his DNA, leaving open the possibility that Rivera was guilty. On December 9, 2011, the Illinois Appellate Court made a landmark decision deeming Rivera's conviction unjustified and untenable. Subsequently, on January 6, 2012, State Attorney Waller made a significant announcement not to appeal the third reversal of Rivera's conviction. After spending two decades behind bars, Juan Rivera was finally free. In recognition of his innocence, Rivera received a certificate of innocence and $213,600 in state compensation. Then, in October 2012, Rivera took legal action filing a federal wrongful conviction lawsuit against Lake County law enforcement officials, alleging their involvement in planting evidence. In the federal suit, Rivera's attorneys brought forth evidence to suggest police tried to frame Rivera prior to his first trial. The prosecution had intended to utilize a pair of shoes, allegedly Rivera's, that was stained with Holly's blood as crucial evidence. However, these shoes were not available in the United States until after the crime had been committed. During the investigation, a receipt was discovered proving the shoes were purchased after the crime occurred. The prosecution originally planned to present these shoes as evidence against Rivera in his first trial. However, the defense threatened to summon a witness who could prove the shoes were acquired after the crime, shedding light on potential police misconduct and evidence tampering. Almost immediately, the prosecution dropped the shoes from their list of exhibits. Subsequent testing conducted on the shoes unveiled a mixture of the victim's DNA and the unidentified suspect's DNA. This strongly suggests police planted the victim's blood on a pair of shoes, passing them off as Rivera's, while inadvertently adding the real perpetrator's DNA as well. Rivera's federal lawsuit reached a resolution in March of 2015 with a historic settlement of $20 million, marking the largest settlement of its kind in Illinois history. Rivera's release came after a lengthy and complicated legal process that included multiple trials, appeals, and the emergence of DNA evidence which exonerated him. After his final acquittal, he could not be retried due to double jeopardy concerns. Rivera's case serves as a stark example of the potential for wrongful convictions, particularly when confessions are relied upon without substantial corroborating evidence. DNA evidence proved 
Rivera was not the perpetrator, and yet the prosecution carried on with the case. Even though Rivera was finally released after 20 years in prison, his case highlights the importance of ensuring individuals with intellectual disabilities have appropriate legal representation and safeguards to protect their rights during interrogations and legal proceedings. His three wrongful convictions and subsequent exoneration underscores the need for reforms in the criminal justice system to prevent similar miscarriages of justice. The case of Juan Rivera stands as a powerful testament, casting a long shadow over the specter of wrongful convictions and reaffirming the profound significance of unwavering commitment to the unerring pursuit of justice. It beckons us to confront pivotal inquiries, delving deep into the very fabric of interrogation practices within criminal proceedings, imploring us to reckon with the pressing necessity of comprehensive reform within the hallowed halls of our criminal justice system. In its somber wake, we are compelled to ensure that justice, untarnished and true, prevails even amidst the whisper of coerced confessions, so that such injustices may never again darken our collective conscience. Thanks for watching. Share this video with a friend. Please like, subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of brand new videos.